He was the greatest smuggler in American history. No, he was very shrewd. He was very smart. He was very uh, calculating. His customized superplane evaded sophisticated radar and outran government air patrols. He was an outstanding pilot. And landed tons of drugs in the last place authorities expected. Compared to anyone else in the drug business, he was a genius. Find out how he did it next on Masterminds. In the early 1980s, the Reagan administration declared war on drug smugglers. Our commitment to this program is unshakable. Colombian drug cartels were hiring Americans to fly their narcotics into the U.S. Authorities identified Florida as the main point of entry and learned the smugglers fit a consistent profile. The individuals with the flashy gold and the watches and the, the, as I refer to as the Miami Vice type that uh, you know, they, they want to almost advertise that I am a drug smuggler. Customs and drug enforcement agents targeted these smugglers. The government subsequently put more agents down in Florida uh, to, to combat this. A secret network of sophisticated radar was installed throughout Florida and the Gulf Coast. The government also put up a bunch of planes that were basically flying radar systems designed to catch drug smugglers. Air patrols created a massive dragnet over land and sea. All suspicious vessels were tracked and targeted. 80% of your risk of being arrested is entering the, the shoreline of the United States, being intercepted by Customs or DEA. Authorities' efforts paid off. Drug rings were busted. Tons of narcotics were confiscated. Millions of dollars were recovered. And the smugglers themselves were chased out of the sky. If you looked around down in Miami and down around the, off the Bahamas, all you're going to see is crashed airplanes. In spite of their success, however, the DEA realized one smuggler was eluding their security net and landing billions of dollars worth of cocaine they launched a massive manhunt. This investigation was considered the number one case in DEA worldwide. But authorities couldn't find him because they were looking in the wrong place. This smuggler didn't operate out of Florida and didn't fit the profile. He was an upstanding businessman living in small town Pennsylvania. Rick Lychus was a friend of presidents, a world-class aviation expert and the mastermind who smuggled 10 tons of cocaine into the U.S., lining his pockets with millions. He brought in more cocaine than any other drug smuggling ring in this country, and that's quite an achievement. The question is, how did he do it? <laughs> Rick Lychus is America's most successful smuggler, flying over $20 billion of cocaine into the U.S. From an early age, Lychus is obsessed with flight. He just loved to fly. He got his pilot's license when he was still in high school. He was gifted at flying and at the mechanics of the planes. After graduating college in the late 70s with a degree in aeronautics, Lychus starts a business in Scranton, Pennsylvania called Air America. The company specializes in luxury upgrades to small planes. If you're flying a plane to Canada, it's nice if you don't have to stop to refuel. Bring your plane to Rick, pay him 100,000, and he can outfit it. The quality of work that came out of Air America was top notch, it was excellent. Air America was very well known and had a very good, very good reputation in the airline industry. He was really good to his workers. He paid him a fair wage, more than a fair wage. They all liked him. Rick donates to local charities, befriends the police, even flies the state governor around on business. He ingratiated himself with politicians, with government officials, 
with leaders of the community. Air America thrives until recession hits hard in 1980. Rick's corporate clients are replaced by shady characters, requesting their planes be outfitted with hidden cargo space. One of them insists on paying his bill with a bag containing 3,000 quaaludes. Desperate for cash, Rick tries to sell them. Well, his mechanic happened to know somebody down in Philly that could probably move these things. One of the first sales he made was to an undercover cop. <laughs> Rick is arrested and questioned. Authorities quickly determine he's a financially strapped businessman, not a serious dealer. But because the DEA suspects his company is being used by drug runners to modify their planes, they offer him a deal. The DEA recruited him almost immediately off of that Quaalude thing. In return for dropping the charges, Lychus agrees to report any suspicious activity at Air America. So he was kind of, he was kind of the other drug business, whether he liked it or not. Rick realizes the DEA is right. Many of his clients are drug smugglers, and they're making millions more than him. Then in 1981, one of Rick's shady customers offers him a big payday to pilot for a Tampa pot smuggling ring. With Air America now on the brink of bankruptcy, Lychus accepts. Long range goal, he wasn't gonna stay in that business forever. At least that's not his, that wasn't his original intent. His original intent was to make a little money, boost his business up so he could turn his back on smuggling. But Rick quickly discovers the people he's hired to fly for are amateurs. Most drug smugglers were people who used the merchandise themselves. They weren't the most stable, reliable people. He commented to his friends about how sloppy they were. Fuel tanks sit dangerously exposed in the cabin. And the route he's forced to fly is crawling with DEA. But Lychus manages to land the plane and earn his money. After flying two more runs, he quits the ring. But his professionalism brings him to the attention of Jorge Ochoa. Jorge Ochoa was one of the main members of the Medellin Cartel, which was a group of individuals who controlled the cocaine coming into the United States. When you have access to a person like Jorge Ochoa and you work directly for him, transporting his cocaine, you can't get any bigger than that. Ochoa dazzles Rick with promises of millions and all the adventure he can handle, smuggling the cartel's cocaine. Still in desperate need of money, Rick accepts. But the Colombian leaves him with a warning. If you cheat us, we'll kill you. Rick accepted that and came home. <laughs> the problem Lychus now faces is how to make the 6,000-mile round trip from Pennsylvania to Columbia. He knows landing to refuel during the voyage risks alerting authorities. But the only aircraft that can fly nonstop are large cargo planes. Those airplanes get on the watch list right off. And eventually, those airplanes get caught. So Rick sets out to turn an innocent-looking Cessna 310, designed to fly 900 miles, into a long-distance superplane. The first step is to increase fuel capacity. Rick took a plane that would normally carry 2,000 gallons of fuel and outfit them so they could carry 6,000. But the government had law enforcement looking for airplanes that had tanks inside the cabin or suspicious-looking plumbing. So Lychus stores extra fuel in rubber bladders, hidden in the nose, under the cabin floor, in the luggage compartments, and in hollow spaces in the wings. The plane was basically a flying fuel tank. To control the flow of fuel from these extra tanks, Lychus builds a centralized distribution system that supplies the engines evenly while maintaining aircraft balance. But with added fuel comes added weight. 
Once you add that much fuel, you needed to reinforce the wings, you needed to reinforce the wheel struts, you needed to increase the strength of the engines. So he would put in engines with much more horsepower. Anyone looking at it would say there's no way that plane can fly from here to Columbia. To avoid suspicion from authorities, Lychus obtains an FAA certificate, declaring all the modifications perfectly legal. And law enforcement doesn't have any probable cause to mess with the airplane. Inside the cockpit, Rick installs custom-designed radar to alert him to weather conditions and government air patrols. If Rick was a genius, it wasn't only equipping the planes, it was figuring out a way of evading the radar and drug enforcement system. To defeat the DEA security dragnet, Lychus targets a crooked customs agent who sells him a list of radar locations, plus flight paths and schedules of all coastal patrol aircraft. He also sets up a radio network spanning two continents and develops a secret communications code to keep in contact with the cartel during flight. Now he was very shrewd. He was very smart. He was very uh, calculating. Uh, it was obvious he put a lot of thought in the, each step that he did. Throughout his preparations, Rick is careful not to arouse the suspicion of his contacts in the DEA. The agents got very close to Rick. Part of it was that he is a charming guy, and I think he charmed them. Finally, after three months of planning, Rick takes off on his maiden voyage and flies a direct route to Columbia. Thirteen hours later, he arrives. While the Colombians load his plane with coke, Rick makes a careful calculation of the plane's new weight and the exact length and state of the runway. The trouble is the fields that they were taking off from were generally unpaved. There were trees at the end. After a short rest, Rick departs. His tiny plane carries 800 pounds of cocaine and is 2,000 pounds heavier than the recommended limit. The plane had to struggle to get off the ground and clear those trees. And off the coast of Columbia, there's, there are a lot of wrecks of planes that didn't quite make it. The engine modifications and upgraded horsepower in Rick's plane get him safely airborne, but he doesn't return home by the same route. Instead, he takes a new flight path that authorities had never even considered, the 73rd Meridian. He figured out that if he could equip the planes to fly further, he would stay out of the pattern of radar detection. But five hours into the flight, Rick's custom-built aircraft detection system alerts him to a Navy tracker plane hot on his tail. Using his weather radar, he locates a nearby electrical store. If you're getting painted by radar and what you're worried about is being caught and going to the jail for the rest of your life, you might be willing to go into a storm assuming that the law enforcement pilot's not gonna do that. To escape, Rick flies straight into the heart of the storm. Rick was an outstanding pilot. If he wasn't the best drug smuggling pilot, he was damn close. The Navy vessel refuses to follow and loses him on the radar. Two hours later, Rick emerges from the storm and turns sharply inland. Flying below radar, he heads for an abandoned commuter landing strip. He approaches the runway, but instead of landing, he rises sharply to 1,500 feet. After flying 3,000 miles from Columbia, he appears on radar for the first time. He would fly very low altitudes to penetrate the radar and pop up so he could look as though he's a normal airplane. Rick then radios the Scranton control tower and has them log his flight as a brief commuter hop. Arriving safely home, he unloads 800 pounds of cocaine and collects over $1 million. His success, however, will be threatened when his Florida pot smuggling days come back to haunt him.
Rick Lychus has been paid over a million dollars by the Medellin cartel for smuggling 800 pounds of cocaine into the U.S. The cartel is so impressed, they have Rick make regular runs for them over the next year. Rick was in it because it was an adventure, and the money allowed him to do the adventurous things that he wanted to do. Gaining confidence, he now expands his operations hiring extra pilots and increasing flights. It's like you're feeding a mouse to a, to a big cobra. If you're going to be really careful the first couple of times you do it. But if that cobra doesn't bite you, pretty soon you're just casually lifting the lid, throwing the mouse in and closing the lid. And you do that time and time again. Lychus prides himself on the efficiency of the operation. He used to joke that he was the Federal Express of the drug business. Rick used to brag that he would be uh, plus or minus three minutes of any time you told him anywhere in the world. The first four trips we did, the Colombians were ready for us. When we were ready for the fifth trip, the Colombians told us we had to wait because we ran them out of product. They were giddy with the schedule. They never lost a flight, never crashed. They always delivered on time. And the Colombians appreciated that. They even gave him a raise. Meanwhile, the DEA, not realizing that Rick is a smuggler, lean on him for more information about the drug trade. And he did manage to provide a lot of useful information, but it was very strategically chosen. Then, in 1984, disaster strikes. One day, the Cobra's pissed, and he bites you. You see, you think. Why did that happen? That's never happened before. The Tampa pot ring that Lychus flew his first smuggling runs with is busted. He is indicted along with 15 others and sent to Florida for trial. Rick's defense was, yes, he flew those runs, but he was only doing that in order to gain information about this nasty drug ring for his friends in the government. Lychus even convinces his DEA handlers to testify on his behalf. They all either came down or wrote testimonials to his fine, upstanding character. But Rick's biggest fear is the Colombians. To convince them that he's not ratting them out, he flies coke runs every weekend during the trial. Each weekend, he'd come home and dropped his lawyers off, hopped in the airplane and went to Colombia and brought a load back. He'd bring in. 200 to 300 kilos of coke, drop them off, get a little bit of sleep, and fly back down to Florida on Sunday to be ready to sit in trial again Monday morning. The trial lasted 11 weeks, and during that time, he made 11 flights smuggling cocaine. Rick makes $13 million flying these drug runs and is the only defendant. The jury acquits. But Rick's enormous smuggling success leaves him with millions of dollars to launder. He enlists a corporate Scranton banker, Michael Coffey, to hide the cash offshore. Michael Coffey helped launder Rick's money by not filling out the proper documentation. Michael was ambitious, and he made a little extra for providing this service. But Rick suddenly faces a bigger issue. Jim Cooper is in police custody. He has crashed his plane into the car of a man waiting to offload drugs and killed him. Everybody says, I crashed the airplane on top of this car. And I say, this guy parked his car underneath my airplane. He had done cocaine all day long and was blissed out of his head, and he and I met in the middle of the runway. When Cooper is charged with felony murder, his first call is to Rick Lychus. Rick had the option of throwing a little money my way. He could have said, look, you need to disappear, go down the islands and get a tan for about nine months. But he didn't choose that. Jim was facing up to 20 years in jail. And instead, he worked out a plea deal where he didn't get any jail time. And in exchange, he provided information about Rick. Armed with Cooper's confession, the DEA makes its move on Air America. and. Rick Lychus. And the way we did that was what we referred to as following the paper trail. 
In other words, going after where he landed an airplane, finding out there was a gas receipt, where he purchased uh, radio equipment, finding out there was receipts for that. The feds also bring in a money laundering specialist to examine Rick's bank transactions. Realizing authorities are closing in, Lychus immediately wires $30 million to the Cayman Island of St. Eustatius and flees there himself. St. Eustatius and a lot of the islands don't have extradition treaties with the United States. Forensic accountants trace his money to the island, and the DEA appeals to local authorities. Myself and another agent pr provided information showing that Rick was wanted back in the United States. They prevailed upon the government there to deport him as an undesirable alien. St. Eustatius law enforcement agrees to cooperate. In 1986, Rick is arrested by local police, taken to the airport, and handed over to the DEA. They got him, put him on a plane, brought him back. When they got into U.S. airspace, they told him he was under arrest. Rick is charged with conspiracy to smuggle cocaine. To avoid 345 years in jail, he cooperates with the investigation and reveals where he has hidden the cash. He seized over $21 million in cash and or assets. He also gives up his team, all of whom end up serving time. Rick himself goes to jail for eight and a half years. Rick was a combination of Christopher Columbus and Charles Lindbergh. Rick wasn't afraid to take a risk. He wasn't afraid to learn about something he knew nothing about. Compared to anyone else in the drug business, he was a genius. Bottom line is, he hurt a lot of people. I mean, you bring in nine tons of cocaine, you're hurting people. You're hurting children, you're hurting families, you're hurting people. Since his release, Rick Lychus has gone straight and started a new life in Florida. Last thing I heard, he was living in a place called Smuggler's Cove. Very apropos. Oh, yeah.